first tape on word processing, we showed you some of the more elementary aspects of the word processor and word processing technique. And in this one, we're going to try to show you some of the more advanced features. In that first tape, we illustrated these elementary methods by generation of a document from scratch. Here, we're going to take more of an approach in which we deal with existing documents and we show you how to revise or modify or improve documents and how to make new documents from old and so forth. This latter form of activity, as a matter of fact, is the main, uh, represents the main advantage of word processing. It's in the revision and the modification and the improvement activities you'll find most of your benefits gained from word processing. Most of the improvements we're going to be talking about here, most of the features are going to be in the form of what you typists might think of as cut and paste operations, where you think of moving fragments of old documents, reports, and so forth around to assemble them into new ones. Uh, we want to make clear to you right at the outset, we're not going to by any means try to show you everything that could be done with either this word processor or any other word processor. The features that you can obtain in the whole range of word processors far exceed anything we could do in this short span of time. And so what we're going to emphasize are a few of the common features you can expect to find in any word processor that you will look at. Now, we're going to start here pretty much as we finished on the first tape. We have the Word 2 version of WordStar up and running. We have our no file menu on the screen here. If you look, and you can see this in your study guide, at the files that we have listed on the directory of disk B here, you'll see some of the familiar ones from before. We've cut down on the number of files quite a bit for this tape so that we can focus on a few of particular interest to us. First thing we're going to do is fetch up a file called VT Promo. It's, it has a file name right here. This stands for Videotape Promo, and it's a, a little promotion document that we wrote a while back as a sort of a preliminary promotion for this particular videotape series. And so without further ado, let's call it up. We do a D to open a document file, and it'll ask us for the file name, and we'll say VTPROMO, return. And if we've typed it correctly, we should get that file up and ready to be edited. And here it is. The title of it is Effective Use of Small Computers. You'll notice that the control B before and after means that this is a bold-faced line and so forth. OK. Now, this is a pretty much a text document. We can skim our way through it. We can go down and look at the various parts of it. And it's going to be very difficult for you to read on the screen. Our emphasis is going to be more mainly on how you move sections of this around. So if you can't read it on the screen very clearly, don't worry about it. You can read it in your study guide if you're interested in seeing the detail. One of the first things I want to show you here is a operation that is very powerful and often used in word processors. It's the idea of find and replace. This particular document, if you were to read through it, makes several references to the so-called CPM operating system. I'm going to show you an example of something we might do in which we, uh, let's say, have this situation. We've decided to use the same promotional document, but we're not going to use the CPM operating system. We're going to use the so-called Unix operating system. We want to change the word or phrase or designation CPM to Unix throughout this document. We can do that in the following way. And by the way, while we're at it, uh, we will remove the, uh, the uh, uh, menu here to give ourselves a full range look at the document. You remember how we do that. We hit help, H, and level zero, return, and we find ourselves now with a whole screen full of space to use here. Okay, now I'm going to do a command called find and replace, and I'll do control, find and replace, and I'll get a message here. It says, what do you want to find? And I will find CP slash 
M, all capitalized, return, and I want to replace it, we might say, with what? I'll replace it with UNIX, that's Unix. Okay, so I want to find every place CPM occurs, I want to replace it with Unix. I'll do another return. There are a variety of options here that I won't list for you. If I wanted to, I could do a question mark and it would tell me uh, the various things I can do. The one I will do is the G option, which means global. It means do it every place. So I'll hit G, and now I'll hit return, and let's see what happens. We'll focus in on the screen for this. Here we see the blinking cursor right here, and it says it's found CPM. Up in the corner of the screen, and I won't show you this, it asks me the question, do you want to replace this or not? And I will say yes, and watch what happens to CPM when I say yes. It turns into Unix. Okay, now move over to here. The next occurrence of CPM is marked at this particular point, and the question is asked, do I want to change that one? And the answer is yes, and I will, and it changes to Unix. Now, my cursor has moved all the way to the end of the document, which means I have found all occurrences and I'm done. Okay, so that very simply is a simple version of find and replace. If I had a thousand occurrences in a large document of a phrase I wanted to change, I could have done this, I could have specified do it without asking me, and I could have made those thousand changes in less than a minute. Okay, let's go back to the top of the document now, do something else. We're now going to illustrate some sort of cut and paste ideas relative to blocks. There are a lot of block movements that can be done here. Let me call back up, I'll go help. H3 to, oops, to call up the block menu again. I didn't quite do that right, excuse me. I'll delete that and I will do help H level three, return. I didn't have to do return. And if I look on my screen here and do a control K to give myself the block menu, that's what I'm looking for. I see on the block menu a variety of things I can do. Now you have a study guide in which these are listed and I advise you as we go through these steps to look at the various things I can do with respect to so-called blocks. I'm gonna go in here and mark a block of text and I'm gonna manipulate it a little bit, all right? And I'm gonna not refer back to this list because you have a copy of this sort of thing and I'm going to uh, use the commands if I can remember them, and I think I can, to show you the sorts of things that can be done. So we'll change the help, we'll go off the block menu, we'll change once again the help menu back to zero and uh, start. So let's uh, roll this up a little ways, oh, the other way, excuse me. Let's go down here and just for fun, take as our block we want to move this first paragraph. Now this is not going to be a meaningful thing to do in the context of this particular document, but let's say for some reason we want to move this paragraph from where it is now to some other location within the document. We can put the cursor here and mark the beginning by doing a control KB. Notice what happens. I get a highlighted marker here that's got a B in it. That marks the beginning of my block. Now I will move my cursor down, go down a ways here to find a whole paragraph if I can. Well, I better not do a whole paragraph, it's too big for the screen. Let's just go to that line right there. Let's say I'll select that portion of this paragraph, just for purposes of illustration, and I'll say that's the end of the block. The beginning I've marked, I'll mark the end with a control K, K, and look what happens. The entire block becomes highlighted. Let's take a little longer view of that. That's the block that I have designated that I can now manipulate. I can delete it, I can copy it, I can move it, I can send it to a file, I can do any one of these sorts of things. Let's just for fun go down a place in the document. Let's go down to this particular place. Let's say, oh, let's go right up here at that particular spot in the document with our cursor. Beginning of that paragraph. I'm going to insert the block I just copied by means of a block copy command to that position. What will happen will be the block will be inserted into there everything else will be pushed down. It's the normal sort of an insert operation that you like to do in the sense that it preserves the rest of the document and makes it easy to stick things in the middle. So I will do a, a control K, and I think I remember this right. I believe a V is a block move. Watch right there, and there the block came in, got stuffed right into that position. The previous paragraph is pushed down. That's a useful sort of thing to be able to do, either in the form of editing a single document or in just generally moving things around from one document to another. Let me show you another sort of an example that is a very powerful idea. Let me go to uh, another position in the document. Let me go uh, up to the beginning. Notice I moved it. I eliminated at the top of this document what I formerly had there. So I did a move rather than a copy. I could have copied and made two versions of this same block if I had wanted to do that. 
I'm going to show you something else here now. I'm going to move something else into this position, which also won't make a great deal of sense in the context of this document, but it'll illustrate things. I have a particular file stored away on this disk that is a schedule. It's kind of a graphics uh, uh, row and column schedule that I sometimes use to send out to people when I like to find out what their busy times are when I'm trying to conduct meetings. What, and, and of course, once having created that particular file, it's kind of tough to create. It takes quite a while fooling around with the word processor to generate that sort of thing. Once having generated it, it's very nice if I can reuse it over and over again. I'm going to show you how I can do that. I have my cursor right here, and I'm going to say I want to do a block move, which is Control-K. And I don't have my menu on here anymore to tell me what the various options are, but one of the options I can remember is to read from a file, which means read a file and put, it, put whatever's in that file in that position. That is an R, and I'll type an R, and it will ask me, I believe, the name of the file to read. And that file, I happen to remember, is named Schedule, S-C-H-E-D-U-L-E. -E. And when I hit the carriage return to enter that file name, the cursor used to be here. It's moved now, but that's where it was before I entered into this command, and so the schedule file ought to show up in this document from another file, another document file when I hit return. Let's see if it does. And there it is. And as a matter of fact, it's a, uh, I move it around, I went the wrong way, excuse me, I wanted to get it up where we could see it a little better. There's the schedule file. And it is, as, uh, as I told you, rows and columns. These vertical lines, as it turns out, are kind of tough to do. Uh, that is to say, they're time consuming to do on this word processor, so I'm glad not to have to do it every time I want to generate this schedule. Once again, if I move the cursor down, you see my old document having been pushed down below this particular point. Okay? Now, the last thing I'm going to show you in the way of block operations is the operation of sort of cleaning up and doing a, a editing of a particular portion of a, of a file. Let me just go down here a little ways. I'll find a particular one that seems attractive. Here's a paragraph. You don't have to, to read it. It's on your screen. It's just a paragraph. What I want to do with this paragraph is change its nature. It happens to be talking about me as the instructor for this course, so I'm saying to myself, I would like to feature this little paragraph and make it stand out a little more. I'll do that by changing the spacing to single spacing and changing the margins such that it shows up as a tight little block. This is really the sort of thing we did in tape one, but it shows you how that, that sort of thing applies in editing as well as in creating a document. I'll do it very quickly here, and, and uh, you can follow it in the study guide. I'll change the left margin to 10. I'll change the right margin to, let's say, 60. Oops, I did that 50. I didn't want to do that. 60. Return. Notice the margins change up here at the top. I'll change the spacing, line spacing, to 1 instead of 2. Uh, and I will now do paragraph reform. When I do that, this entire paragraph ought to be squinched in and made narrower and changed to a single space paragraph and achieve the effect I want. So let's put the camera on that. I will hit uh, paragraph reform. Here it is. And what I just said will happen if I've done everything right. It rolled up, of course, so let me roll it down and we can oh, roll it the other way. I always do that backwards. And there it is trying to get it in the middle of the page, and I'm having my difficulty doing it. Here's that paragraph. It's now in a nice, compacted form. It's also, you'll notice, not justified anymore. And the reason for that is when I called up this word processor, I didn't have the justification mode set, and I went back to non-justified text. Notice, here's a little feature you might, I might point out to you. Here is a dotted line that goes all the way across the page. And over here is a little command that I have typed that is a so-called page break, forced page break, it says dot PA, and it says when you get to this point, WordStar, and you see this, please insert a new page there. In other words, I had as my desire, when I got to that particular point in the, in the document, I wanted to go to the top of the next page. I can force that to happen, or I can, if necessary, um, uh, allow WordStar to go ahead and generate the pages at the appropriate points. Okay? Now, that's about the end of what I wanted to do with respect to the uh, manipulation of blocks, and I would like to now vacate this document. I've kind of wrecked it. I've put schedule in it, and I've clobbered things up and moved them around, and so in the sense of having created anything meaningful, I haven't. So what I will do is just do control quit, which says don't modify the original document. It asks me here, do you want to abandon this without doing anything? And the answer to that question is, I sure do, and I say yes.
Okay, now I'm back in uh, WordStar again, ready to do something else. The next thing I want to do is to show you the creation of a form letter to be sent to people on a mailing list. We're used to receiving these all the time. We get them, the sweepstakes sorts of things, we get them from the oil companies and the like. You can generate them yourself. Now let me show you how to do it. The first thing I'm going to do is to show you a copy of the mailing list. And I'll do that. The particular mailing list I have here is called PCADD. That means Planning Committee Address DAT. It's a data file. This is the list of people who are on a committee who, who, who I wish to send announcements to. And I'll just show you what that looks like. This happens to be a so-called non-document file. That's a distinction I won't bore you with right here, but I'll say N to open up a non-document file, PCADD.DAT, and I should get the listing on this file. I'll give you a general idea of what it looks like. And here it is. You'll notice it's a list, a very tight list of people's names. Let's just look at the top here. There's my name, Terry A. Smay, my department, electrical engineering, and my address, which on campus here is Coover Hall. Every other line has a similar entry, William Abraham, chemical engineering, Sweeney Hall, and so forth. Each of the people on this list is a member of the committee, and each of them have a line in this file which contain their name, their department, and their address. And that's all. I want you to kind of remember that. It'll be in your study guide if you need to refer to it. I'll quit looking at that one. And now I'll go look at, uh, now I'll go consider the problem of generating the form letter that I'd like to send. Here's what I'm going to do, and watch this very carefully. I'm going to open a document file, and I'm going to call this file just greeting. I'm going to send these people greetings, not really a meeting notice. And I'll, that'll be a new file because I don't have a file by that name. And it'll come up, and here we are. Let me change my margins back, by the way. Change my left margin to 1 and my right margin to 73, which are my values I'd like to have. Now, I'm in file greeting. What I want to do here is to begin to put together my uh, letter that I'm going to send to these people. I'm going to use a trick I learned a couple of minutes ago to do this. I'm going to copy into here the heading, the standard heading that I've prepared separately for this letter. And I'll copy it in and show you what it is. It's called PC head. That's the file name, meaning planning committee heading. So I will do a block, read. It'll ask me, I hope, what file. And I'll say PC H E A D. And if I've done everything right, in it will come. Okay, now let's look at this for a moment. It's got a bunch of gibberish up at the top, which we'll ignore for a moment. Let's look, this is all this file consists of, is this kind of, I hope, pretty looking sort of thing, this square, which has in it name, department, and address, and notice each of those words is surrounded with a particular symbol, an ampersand before, and, or you might think of that as an and sign, an ampersand after. That identifies each of those three as variables, which are to be substituted for as the letter is generated. Now, let's go back up above here and see how the substitution is to take place. The DF command here, the OP command, by the way, just means omit page numbering. So that's just one we can ignore. The DF command means define the file that the data is to come from. The file is called PCADDDAT. That's the file we showed you a couple of minutes ago that's got all these names, departments, and addresses on them. And this is a command that says read variables from that file, RV, and the first variable you read give it the name name, the second variable you read, give it the name department, the third one, give it the name ADDR, meaning address, and as you generate this letter, when you see name, department, or address, put in the values you're getting from the data file. So in the first one, it should put in Terry Smay, electrical engineering, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, electrical engineering, Coover Hall, and then it should repeat and do that for each and every entry on the file. Now, let's finish this. We'll just give these people a very simple greeting. Let's go down to the end of the file here. Here's my cursor now. I'll put in a couple of carriage returns. I'll type them a little message. It'll go something like this. Hi, uh, let me, I don't want it to be all caps. Hi, there. And then I'll put ampersand name. Oops, I did something, I did a control. I did, I did something you always do with word processors, hit control instead of shift. Hi there. Uh, ampersand name 
ampersand over there at, and then there I'll give their uh, department, which would be ampersand. I did control again. I'm sorry. Uh, that's for line spacing. I, I, I always mix up control and shift. You'll do that too. It's easy to do. Over there at ampersand DEPT, I'll make that caps just to be consistent, DEPT ampersand and uh, uh, a period. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. And then I'll put a page break at the end of that so that I generate a new page after each letter. So this is the letter I'm going to send these people. It should go to that address and it should have that message on it. Okay, now let's get out of this file and print a few letters and see what happens. So we'll do a control done. Okay, and I'll be back in my no file menu. We're going to rack the camera down here now and look at the uh, printing as it takes place. And I'll tell you what's going on up here on the menu. And you can look in your study guide if you want to check this. On the no file menu, check this in your study guide, there is a so-called word star option listed that's called the M command, which says run mail merge. And that's what I'm going to do here. This particular utility in this, for this manufacturer is called mail merge. So I'll do an M. Okay, and it will ask me a question or two, namely one question. It says, name a file to merge print. Well, that file name is greeting. I just built the file, and it's called greeting. And uh, I'll do a return, and it will begin to ask me the same sort of questions about printing as I always get from WordStar. And I'll simply answer them all the same by just hitting a carriage return. Pause for paper change, no. Ready the printer. Now, when I hit the next one, I'll begin to print. So let's uh, look at let's look with our camera at the printer, and let's focus right in on that. And we're going to generate these form letters now. And here I hit return, and away we go. We hope. Let's see what happens. I'll generate a few of them. There's about 15 on the list. Notice if you look in there close, you see my name on the thing. That's good. Now here it's kicking out the first page, starting the second one. We'll do about one more and then we'll quit. Because there's something I want to show you on this third one. I believe it'll work out. We'll see. No, I guess it didn't. Let's quit. We'll do a P. To quit, we can always abort this operation, and that's what I'm just doing here. Now let's look at these first three letters. Here's the first one, and let's kind of come in on this with the camera, and, and it, I think you probably saw it go by. It, once again, there's a copy of this in the study guide. As we promised you, the substitutions were made. My name, my department, my address, and then down here in the body of the text is my name and my department. The second letter was generated. This is the second person on the list, William Abraham, chemical engineering. His address is shown here, and his name is embedded in the list, and his department, and so forth. It gets kind of boring at this point because they all look the same. Here's uh, Carl Anderson, ag engineering, and so forth. Here's his name and his uh, ag engineering here. Something that isn't shown here, if I'd written a little printed a little longer sentence, you would have seen that WordStar would have very nicely wrapped around and taken care of variable length variables here so that you'd have a nice looking letter no matter how long a department name or address that you had. Okay, that then, and let me do a Y to abandon print here, that constitutes the end of that little exercise in which we've shown you what really boils down to another version of a cut and paste activity, namely an activity involving the generation of of, uh, of uh, form letters via a mail merge utility. And almost any word processor you buy has, at least as an option, a form of mail merge package that you can use. Now, as our last operation I want to show you, I want to show you a spelling checker. Let's uh, do the following. Let's look at a file we generated during tape one. It had, as a matter of fact, you've probably noticed this if you watch tape one, there was a spelling error left in that, actually by error. The file is, uh, called uh, SAMP1. Let's look at SAMP1, D, SAMP1. And it uh, is the same file we generated for you earlier. I've added a couple of sentences to it just to throw in some more misspelled words. Here's the original file right up here. The word making right here was misspelled as mating, M-I-D-I-N-G. And then this last sentence has an additional number of misspelled words in it. Is is spelled I-S-S. -S. 
paragraph is misspelled, as you can see. Here's one I want you to look at. Which is what this should say, and I've misspelled it which. And uh, there are other examples. Here's a word down here. Let's flash down a little. There we go. Hawkeye. That's not a misspelled word. We'll be interested to see, however, if this system recognizes that as a valid word. We could go on looking at some of these other things. Well, we might point out that in addition to looking for misspelled words, this system looks for typographical errors. That's probably the main way uh, that it's used is to look for typos that you just don't observe while you're generating word processing documents. So let's quit here. Control quit. And as our last official act looking at this, let's call up still another utility from the uh, no file menu, the spell star utility called S. We hit S, and we'll get a series of prompts here asking us the name of the file to check. And we could also be adding things to the dictionary. We'll ignore that for the moment because we're not going to show it in this tape. The file is SAMP1, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, this is the file we just looked at. Now we get a series of prompts here. It says, what do you want to do? Check spelling, maintain dictionary, or quit? Well, I want to check spelling, so I'll hit C. Now it says, what else do you want to do? And I, uh, this allows me to change uh, such things as supplementary dictionaries I may have that cover such special fields as electronics or medicine or agriculture or whatever. I don't have any supplementary dictionary to deal with here. I do have to go over, and I'll just do it very quickly, and change the name of the dictionary I'm going to use because it is not on the B drive, so I'll just do that. I'll say the D control is what I want to change, and I want to change that to A, and notice that's what I get here. I now have the dictionary I'm going to use, which is the one that is supplied with Spellstar on the A drive and I'm ready to go so I will we're gonna watch what happens on the screen here fairly carefully it'll take a little while to do it I'm going to now do a spelling check by means of hitting return now notice here things are happening the document has already had its number of words counted there's 76 words in the document 60 different words that is to say words like the and so forth which are repeated are omitted from the check they're only checked one time the dictionary has 21,026 words in it, 8,000, 9,000 words of it have been checked, 10,000, 11,000. It's whipping through the dictionary right now, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and it quits. It says it found eight misspelled words. You might say, why didn't it go to the end of the dictionary? And the answer is because there aren't any letters, there aren't any words in this document that start with Y or Z, one would presume. Eight misspelled words. Let's look at them. We have a command down here that says, let's enter L to look at the misspelled words. We'll do that. There's an L. And here are the misspelled words. TM is a misspelled word. Remember, that's our trademark. ISS is a misspelled word, and that was a misspelled word. It should have been is. Works is misspelled. Hasn't isn't misspelled, but it must not have been in the dictionary. Mating is misspelled. Enough is misspelled. Hawkeye isn't misspelled, but it wasn't in the dictionary. Paragraph is misspelled, and it should have been paragraph. Now let's correct them. Down at the bottom, it says enter return to flag the errors. I'll hit a return. Now what I'm going to find myself in is my original document, and I can go through this original document and look at the errors and actually change them. And I'll do another return. I have to do that twice in this particular case. And here will come the document up. It'll be pretty much as if I was back in WordStar with one small exception. I will have a reverse video position uh, pointer at, my, at the thing that it's asking me to change. I can fix or ignore, essentially. I have four options, including fix or ignore. Since tr trademark is right, I will ignore that. This moves me, moves me down to mating, and I will fix that, and I will do it with an F, and this will allow me then to move over a couple of positions, eliminate the, the D, put in the K, and making it making. I'll then do a Control L to repeat. Oh, I, I made that uppercase. It's been pointed out to me. So let me, uh, well, it's, I, I did that wrong, and I'll change that. I won't bother to change it now because it, I'm just illustrating it. Is is misspelled. I want to fix that, and I'll go over two positions, and I'll delete that character, and then I'll do a Control-L to continue. And I'll just continue through all these. Paragraph I want to fix, and I will put an A in there to fix it. Then I'll do a Control-L to continue. Works I want to fix. And I'll move over one position and delete that and make it an O. And then I'll do a uh, Control-L again. 
enough I want to fix and I'll go over and eliminate the backspace uh, and I'll do control L again Hawkeye is okay so I'll ignore that one that one's okay hasn't is okay so I'll ignore that and I'm done and it says spelling check completed press escape key and I will do that and I'm done okay and I can bail out a word star at this point and have the document corrected well that's the last thing we wanted to show you spelling check mail merge those sorts of things are common features of contemporary word processors this essentially completes what we plan on talking about in this second tape I want to make about two comments to finish up one of them is this you should know your application before you make a decision as to which word processor you want to use. So study what you want to do. Pick a word processor that has the features that you want. The second major thing I want to tell you is look for storage. If you're going to have big documents, make sure that you have plenty of secondary storage in your system with which to store the documents that you may need. Thank you very much. I didn't want to run out of tape on the damn